Okay, here we go. Hello there. Welcome to One Mind Brainwaves. I'm Lori Fernandez, guest hosting for Brandon Staglin this week. Since the pandemic began, we've experienced a sudden and total change in the way we work and live. Polls show women have disproportionately borne the increased responsibilities for full-time caregiving and remote teaching alongside their regular workload and job pressures, and the economic fallout is just as bad. In the last year, nearly 3 million women have had to leave the workforce either voluntarily or through job loss. It's even referred to as a she-session. All of this adds up to increased stress, anxiety, and depression, and in a few minutes, we will be talking with a noted psychiatrist and writer who specializes in women's issues about the pandemic toll on women's mental health. And later, the folks at One Mind Cyber Guide will give us a review of their mental health app pick of the week. But first, we are so excited to have joining us a very talented artist and a friend of the program. She's the Senior Arts and Health Research Scientist at John Hopkins International Arts and Mind Lab. Dr. Tasha Golden, welcome back to Brainwaves. Oh, thank you so much. It's really good to be here again. I'm so excited to speak with you. A lot of your work has focused on women and girls in underserved populations. What have you learned about their mental health and well-being? Uh, thank you. It's a good question. I, um, I have for several years run a program called Project Uncaged, which is a trauma-informed creative writing program for um, teenage girls that are incarcerated in the juvenile justice system. And um, so I think two things come to mind when I think about learning about their mental health. The, the first one is that a lot of times they are dealing with such um, di difficult context. So we think about that in the context of the pandemic right now, they're confronting such difficult contexts that in a way um, it's helpful for us to make sense of their diagnoses and their struggles with mental health in terms of the difficulty that they're experiencing. And that can be um, insightful that sometimes we pathologize or we're quick to say, this is an individual issue, How, what can we get for them? But it's actually a systemic problem or a structural problem that the community can help um, solve for people of this population. But the second thing is related to that in that um, the gift of the arts with this population is that well, we write poems together, but we also publish their poems. I have a few books here. We publish these anthologies of girls' poems and send them to like the mayor's office, city council, elected officials at local and state levels to try to get them to adjust resources and policies that have to do with these girls' lives. But the wonderful thing about making art with them is that you can't read a poem about um, a really even a difficult, super difficult experience without simultaneously recognizing uh, a young person's creativity, artistry, her desire and drive to communicate with the public. Um, and so it, it reminds us that there's both and, that any of us who are going through a difficult time, we are experiencing the difficulty, but we are also human and we're creative and we have resilience and strength and they both exist side by side, which is sometimes difficult to remember when you're in the midst of a, a difficult circumstance. Yeah. That that absolutely made sense. Thank you so much for breaking that down for us. And might that knowledge also apply to pandemic related mental health challenges? <laughs> yes, I mean, absolutely. I think um, there's no denying the context that we're in and it wouldn't make sense to try to deny that or even even escape it except for you know like that's a good coping skill sometimes to know when to draw back and escape in whatever ways make sense for us but um, to remember that whatever the difficult experience works we're, we're in is side by side with the rest of our lives and with the with who we are and as somebody for myself i'll disclose that i have had diagnoses of major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder and when you're in the midst of that sometimes that can feel like that's the only thing that's real um, and recognizing the both and is, I think, a gift of art and creativity and of being reminded, you know, sometimes the most beautiful songs are also the sad ones. Sometimes what looks beautiful to one person is melancholy or sad to the next person or, or ugly or horrifying. Um, so we are rich, complex creatures and none of us um, can be reduced to a diagnosis or to a specific hardship or difficulty we're experiencing. And um, it's, uh, it's one of the beauties of being human that we're complex and ever changing. Absolutely. I think um, as, as someone with major depressive disorder, it's something else to hear something or see something really sad and to watch other people go, wow, that's that's a lot. And you just sit there and you bask in it because it feels validating and it feels seen. And mm -hmm. it's like this thing that you can't really put into words. Maybe it's chords, maybe it's a movie scene, but it's something that makes all those parts that you're trying to hide, either hide or trying to heal or trying to bring out all of those things are, are being 
they have like a light that's shown onto it. So I, I agree with that. And I definitely re- or resonate with that. Um, and, and also for your song, Lay Your Head Down appeared on your album, This Isn't Over Yet. Um, while it was released in 2010, the album's title couldn't be a more apt description for today, for 2021. The song itself as well, it's a bit of a lullaby. It's a bit of a meditation. What inspired it? Oh, thank you. I was really glad when um, Brainwaves asked about this song. It's one that gets um, requested a lot and we hear about it a lot from people. I did write it as a lullaby, but not for children. I wrote it for myself. I wrote it for friends that were going through a difficult time that I felt like they needed some kind of break or respite. And um, so I'll tell a quick story that uh, years ago, I was running a creative writing workshop for um, a juvenile detention facility in Ohio. And um, it was a week long e- event for them. And um, I found out that I was gonna be there in the afternoon doing creative writing, but in the mornings, a choreographer was coming and teaching them a dance to a song. I didn't find out till I got there that it was my song, it was this song. Um, and a couple days into the week, one of the girls kind of snagged me after a session and she said, that's your song that we've been dancing to. And I said, yes. And she's like, well, I love dancing to it, but I also love that um, at night I sing it to myself in bed and it helps me go to sleep. Um, And I think just to what we were talking about, that life is both. And when she described that, I don't think that she was meaning that the song helped her escape her environment. I think the song helped her create a space in which she could be in her environment, like made space around where she was so that she could feel safe and good enough. And um, I mean, the opening of the song says, lay your head down, dear, there's no sorrow here. And of course, sorrow can exist at all times. But I think the here of this song is, um, is something we create our here with our attention. And I think art is a great facilitator and director of attention. And you choose the world you want to create by what you attend to. And I think what that girl was speaking to and what I was hoping to create with this song is that, okay, we're just going to decide that during this song, this is the space that we have, that the time we're creating is for um, letting go, for laying down, for falling in, for starry skies, for something different than just the... Um, the difficult experience that has captured so much of our attention. That's beautiful. And to those listening and watching here, we have Tasha Golden performing Lay Your Head Down for us. Thank you. Lay your head down, dear. There's no sorrow here. Only time for letting go and room for landing light as snow Gentle daylight fading slow, my murmur soft and whisper low So lay your head down So lay your head down Lay your head down, dear There's no sorrow here Only time for starry skies And room for long and languid sighs A gentle dream to close your eyes A night to fall, a moon to rise so lay your head down So lay your head down Dark and dim Gentle song to soft begin You're breathing out You're breathing in So lay your head down 
So lay your head down So lay your head down So lay your head down That was Lay Your Head Down by Tasha Golden. That was just so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that with everyone. I think, you know, it was like a huge heart hug. (laughs) Loved it. (laughs) Thank you so much. It's really lovely to play for you. Aw. So before you go, since you last appeared on Brainwaves, we've added all a new lightning round. Five questions, quick answers, 30 seconds or less for all of your answers in total. Okay. You ready? Sure. Let's do it. Tasha, what type of music or literature do you turn to when you're feeling down? Uh, definitely poetry, um, def- especially Rilke, Mary Oliver, um, Chesla Miłosz. These are three I go to often. Oh, Mary Oliver is so good. Um, <laughs> which gives you most stress relief, a person, dog, cat, or other animal? Oh, my God. I have two black cats, and they are my, they are my self-care. Yes. <laughs> Where do you find small moments of joy? We, um, I never saw myself as a bird watching person, but we got a bird bath last winter and we peek out the door, like just when you're making coffee or running to the kitchen or something, look out the back window and they're taking baths and flying around and it's just joyful. Perfect. What has the pandemic taught you about yourself? Oh, um, the deep teaching is that I, despite all of my logic and science and knowing better, I really did think that the world was supposed to, um, the something the world was supposed to always life was about trying to be happy all the time and this pandemic has been a, a really hard lesson in like oh you know pain is inevitable but suffering is optional the buddhists call it the second arrow right the first arrow was the pain the second arrow is the wish that it hadn't happened and um me and that second arrow i'm, I'm working on not shooting it so often <laughs> Ah, I, I feel that my therapist once told me that she was like, you have to relax on trying to be happy all the time and look for balance instead. And I was like, oof, ouch. All right. Didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and for our last one, what gives you hope? Oh, the young people that I work with, for sure. I've always said that um, the girls that I've had the privilege to write with have been my greatest teachers. And that remains profoundly profoundly true they um their their own hope in their own lives gives me hope and also their work and their drive to change themselves and their communities in the world is um is something that motivates me too that's perfect thank you so much tasha um i just i appreciate your time and, and for you speaking and performing with me today thank you so much Lori. take care talk to you soon with me now to discuss how the pandemic is affecting women's mental health, we have Dr. Pooja Lakshman, clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at George Washington University School of Medicine and founder of Gemma, a digital education platform dedicated exclusively to women's mental health. She's also a frequent New York Times contributor. Dr. Lakshman, welcome to Brainwaves. Thank you so much, Lori. It is such a pleasure to be here. And I just have to say that listening to Dr. Golden play and sing just now was just, oh gosh, it was just incredible. Um, Real self-care for me. So thank you. (laughs) Full body chills for sure. Um, (laughs) It was beautiful. Viewers, don't forget, you can post your thoughts or questions in the comment section of this webcast at any time. Okay, so for our first question, the New York Times recently ran a multimedia report, The Primal Scream, that has been getting a lot of attention. They set up a hotline for mothers to call in and essentially vent. They received thousands of calls. You contributed an article for the series. What is the picture of women's mental health right now and are working mothers at or near a breaking point? 
Yeah. So definitely the picture is not a great one, which I think most of our listeners probably can um, empathize with at this point. Um, You know, when it comes to what we're seeing in terms of women's mental health, in terms of moms that are working in the home or outside the home, we're just, I think 2020 has shown us all of these cracks in the system that of course are not new, that they were, they were all there before, but the way in which women have been betrayed, um, in particular, the patients that I work with, I work with a lot of women who are pregnant or postpartum because I'm a perinatal psychiatrist. And um, over the course of 2020, the amount of fear and anxiety around what is, what's going to happen if I'm pregnant during COVID-19 when we don't really know answers to so many questions. And then also on top of that, the social isolation, right? Because you aren't able to have your friends and your family and this period of time, this profound transition when you're pregnant and you're bringing, you're growing your family, what was once a time that people could come together um, is now a time that everyone has to be apart. So there's just so much grief and so much loss and that's the emotional experience. But then of course, these, there is the economic devastation, the fact that people have been, have lost their homes, people are, you know, out of jobs, all of that um, compounds the situation. So I was just so thrilled to be asked to be a part of the primal screen package. And I feel like the fact that the New York times, um, you know, that came out in the Sunday section of the paper, and it was this whole standalone package to me, that was really um, powerful. Cause I think a lot of people looked at this and they said, wow, this is I mean, they should have known before it was in the New York Times, but (laughs) it kind of gave some validation, I think, to what women have been talking about for the past year in their text threads and on social media kind of gave a wider audience to the problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad that we're able to talk about that now and shed some light on it, because that's definitely not something that's um, talked about as much as it should be. Um, I, I have a seven month old nephew um, that was right smack in the <laughs> middle of the pandemic. Um, and it was so interesting to just even be in the vicinity, you know, of course, being 20 and, and not having any kids of my own, but watching my older sister kind of go through this process of like, you know, it was just her and her husband allowed at the hospital and us not being able to be essentially in her vicinity because of COVID. It was really interesting to watch all of that. And she handled it with grace, but I'm, I'm sure, you know, there's still a lot going on that I don't even know about. Um, so again, thank you so much for highlighting this for, for all the moms out there um, and for all the parents who are taking care of their kids. Um, what has life been like for the patients you see in your practice in Washington, D.C.? Yeah. So it's definitely, it is really interesting to hear that, Lori, that you've kind of gotten a little bit of a snapshot of it <laughs> with your sister. And I think it's, It's really just a picture of um, constant decision making where there are no right answers and no kind of external guidance where you're having to face, make the map for yourself. Is it safe to send my kid to daycare? Is it safe for me to even, you know, run errands, go to the grocery store, right? All these things where everyone's doing something different, right? So I think in my practice, a lot of what I'm seeing is the pressure, this burden that really falls on women primarily to be the ones to make the decisions for their household. And then of course, if you're somebody who already had a history of depression, or if you already had a history of anxiety, your risk of having another mood episode or having a worsening of your anxiety disorder is much higher. We're seeing definitely, you know, in the pregnant and postpartum population, the rates have almost tripled during the pandemic of clinical depression and, and clinical anxiety symptoms. So I would say that, you know, it's the, the mental load of all of this decision-making and then women that just feel like they don't have space um, because they really, they don't, right. You're at home all the time with your whole family. You're working from home. Your kids are home. Um, it, it's this feeling of sort of like being claustrophobic um, where there really isn't even a second, even just, you know, going to the bathroom and and (laughs) by yourself (laughs) feels like it's, you know, a tremendous undertaking. Um, so it's been interesting, you know, from my standpoint as a psychiatrist with my patients is, you know, there's not easy solutions to this. Sometimes the answer is, you know, let's do more therapy or let's increase your medications. But other times the answer is not, you know, to increase medications. It's really kind of just like, um, sitting with 
the difficulty of how difficult things are right now. And, and I, and that was why I was so happy with the article that I wrote, you know, kind of framing this as this isn't burnout because I think burnout is a word that gets thrown around so much. You know, we hear so much about burnout, really wanting to kind of shift the conversation to know this is, this is betrayal. This is our show social structures. These are the, you know, the, the systems that were supposed to protect us and to hold us, um, they have failed. They have failed families. They've failed women. They've failed moms. Um, so, because I think with burnout, it places the responsibility on the individual to be more resilient. Um, whereas when we look at something like betrayal, we're kind of facing externally. And I think that that's really important. Um, out of curiosity, what are some ways to cope with or manage feelings of guilt, worry, grief, despair, panic, and especially for those moms out there, like kind of, as you mentioned before, having to make those constant decisions. And like, again, I'm not a mom, so I could never understand at this current day and age, but I am someone who cannot make decisions. And the idea of doing that for another living being, human being, <laughs> um, it seems just terrifying. So I, I think sharing some of those um I guess, you know, different ways of coping for those listening could be really helpful. Yeah. You know, I work with a lot of patients and myself, I struggle a lot with perfectionism, right? You always just want to feel like you're making <laughs> the exact right choice. And so I think part of it is framing in your mind, the fact that things like perfectionism actually work against you. And especially in a time period, like the one that we're living in right now, there is no perfect decision. There's usually a broad range of right decisions or good enough decisions. Um, so really kind of meditating on, you're not trying to, to be perfect. Um, you're, you're trying to do enough, um, especially in this world that we live in where you can research everything on Google and, you know, go down all of these rabbit holes. I, you know, it's so easy to just kind of fall into that trap of sort of, uh, paralysis. So another piece to remember is that by not making a decision or compulsively researching that actually <laughs> can work against you. Right. Um, and thinking about, you know, what's the worst that could happen and, and recognizing that that's, that's your mind. So there is a technique specifically from a type of therapy that I love that's called acceptance and commitment therapy, and it's called cognitive diffusion, where um, you're nodding your head. <laughs> oh my gosh, and I over here like bobbing yes, my head. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? So that's basically kind of identifying your mind as a separate entity and you can diffuse, you can separate from those anxious thoughts. You can separate from that perfectionism and just be curious about it. Hmm. Like, what is that about? But it doesn't need to be the truth. You don't have to let that power you or guide you. Um, so I, I really encourage my patients to kind of build up that muscle of, you know, psychological flexibility, trying to be flexible with your mind and, and not um, getting stuck in the the perfectionism mindset. Yeah, that was, that sounds very similar. I mean, it's, it's essentially the same technique that I've been given for like intrusive thoughts, uh, you know, pretend that they're a train and watch them go by type of yes, thing. So like, exactly. Yeah. It was exactly. like a, a meditation that we were kind of talking about and, you know, pretending you're walking to this track, you have a seat and every thought is just a train and you just watch it go. And it was really helpful to learn to just separate and say like, this is something I'm watching go by. It's still my brain, but it's not mine. And it was, it was really helpful to hear that and to hear you say that. Definitely. Yeah. And I think it also fits in with this idea of like the yes. And like you can have those thoughts and you can still take action and you can still move forward and making the choices that you need to, it doesn't need to be one or the other. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Financial insecurity and food insecurity are particularly acute for women of color who have lost work in greater numbers, many of whom were already living on the margins. Are those populations also at increased risk for mental health conditions? Absolutely, 100%. And, you know, the really, um, the really 
devastating piece of this pandemic is the fact that the populations that were were already the most vulnerable are the ones that are being the hardest hit. And so we know in particular for Black moms, so for Black women that are pregnant and postpartum, they are less likely to be screened even before the pandemic for something like postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety. And even when they are diagnosed, they're less likely to be referred for treatment and to actually get help. Um, and, and a lot of that is because of the racism that exists in the medical system. Um, and then those are the communities that we know have been hit the hardest um, from COVID from a health standpoint and an economic standpoint. So I think that, you know, as we're kind of seeing the light, you know, fingers crossed seeing the light at the end of the tunnel with some of the vaccines coming out and things like that, I think we're only going to be seeing more of reports about sort of what the devastation is and inequities that have really come out during this pandemic. Um, with the pandemic dragging on and so much being out of any one person's control, are there ways to manage and improve mental and emotional well-being for those whose circumstances may not necessarily change anytime soon? Yeah. So I think it's, I, this is something that I kind of think a lot about, especially in my writing, because on one hand, these are systemic betrayals and, um, the solutions and the responsibility for the solution is not in our hands because it should be these larger structures that are taking care of us. But on the other hand, as a psychiatrist, um, I really do believe that we all have, uh, we all have our own relationship with our minds, right? And that there's ways that we can try to um, lessen our suffering and ways that we can try and make, you know, the best choices possible. And so much of that, I think, is recognizing even the small places that you might have agency in your day and being able to kind of make concrete choices, being able to check things off the list, really focusing on small tasks and um, the things that make you feel empowered. So whether that's, you know, making your bed in the morning, I'm not saying making your bed in the morning is a solution for, <laughs> you know, all of the trauma that people have experienced this year. But I do think that some of these small decisions that you can make um, can be really helpful in terms of your mindset. Yeah. I, for me, making my bed is literally just, I have organized and put something in place today. And even if it's just this one thing, <laughs> like feeling like such a control freak, like even if it's just this one thing, I touched this one thing and I made it the way that I wanted. And to start the day off like that feels really good. So I, I do understand that concept. That Right. It's sort of symbolic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, guest reminder, we're talking about the pandemic's disproportionate mental health toll on women, especially mothers, with Dr. Pooja Lakshman, clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at George Washington University School of Medicine and founder of Gemma. She's also a frequent New York Times contributor. Viewers, don't forget, we do really, truly want to hear from you. If you have any questions, comments, or thoughts for our guests, feel free to post them at any time and let us know if you have coping strategies that have successfully worked for you during the pandemic. How do you find ways to stay focused and what do you try to reduce, um, what do you use to try to reduce your stress levels? If you know anyone who can benefit from the information provided by our guests today, please share this webcast with them. Okay, so now the childcare crisis during the pandemic has revealed the extent to which mothers were barely hanging on in normal times. What do companies need to do to ease the burden on working mothers? And what do we need to do as a community and, and society to support? Yeah, I mean, employer solutions really are such a big part of um, the change. And it needs to be more than just kind of lip service. Like it's not about just doing like resilience training, right? It needs to be taking the onus of the responsibility and taking it away from the individual and the employees and putting it back onto the organization. So that means, you know, having um, accommodations in your performance reviews, you know, from the past year because of the fact that all of your kids are at home with you. So you haven't been able to be as productive and actually looking at, you know, kind of the financial incentives there as well. So I think, you know, it always, when it comes to corporations, it really comes down to sort of holding them accountable and actually looking at the structures that they have in place. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert when it comes to workplace change, but these are just some of the things that I've read and have looked at. For sure. 
Your digital platform, Gemma, offers courses, and you are currently working on a new book about how women can improve their mental and emotional well being by showing care for themselves. What got you thinking about this topic, and why do you think it's so important for women in particular? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think for me, it really came from, um, you know, I've been thinking about this in my own therapy, probably for the past decade, you know, talking with my therapist about what does it mean for me to actually take care of myself. But in 2018, I wrote a piece for Doximity all about women in medicine, and how, you know, we're, we're all burnt out in this medical system, we feel awful, and we're told that we should meditate or do some yoga and feel better. And, you know, try all those things and and it works for a little while, but nothing ever quite sticks and kind of reframing it and realizing, no, like the only thing that's actually worked for me is learning how to say no and set boundaries and limits with my time. Um, So that really got me kind of thinking more about like, well, what really is self-care? And um, around that same time, I started an Instagram account as a psychiatrist, a professional Instagram account. And I just started getting so many questions from women asking me questions about, you know, pregnancy and postpartum and postpartum depression and medications. And of course, on Instagram, I can't answer medical questions, but I realized that there really needed to be a platform that was focused on mental health for women. You know, there's so many classes that you can take once you become a mom, like you can take a class to learn how to breastfeed, you can take a class to learn how to have a natural childbirth, but none of those classes are focused on moms and none of them are mental health focused. So, um, so I created Gemma, which is um, the first digital education platform for women's mental health. And we, um, we have uh, classes that are all digital. Um, we have a mom guilt course that's fully asynchronous and it's, it's only $27. Like one of my goals with Gemma is to have this be very accessible. Um, and then we have Zoom classes that are more in depth. So, you know, last five weeks and, um, you know, you have access to me, a, an expert that's teaching and then other experts in the field. And so I just, uh, you know, that was something that, you um, I'm just super passionate about, you know, giving women access to more education and resources and um, having this be part of the conversation. You know, yes, it's awesome to go to yoga and, you know, meditation is wonderful. um, But I think you also need to be really looking at your own internal landscape and have places and structures in place where you can spend time with your thoughts and feelings. And as we all know, therapy is, is, is really expensive and it's a, inaccessible for a lot of people. So um, trying to find ways that we can be creative to offer up solutions and different um, from different angles. Many people report having felt joy spending more time with family during the initial lockdown phase of the pandemic. Could this usher in a simpler life times where we take breaks or pauses that lead to better mental health? Yeah, I think that that's such a great question because it's something really actually that it's coming up in my practice where people are saying like, look, actually I've got, you know, as much as my kids drive me nuts, (laughs) um, I have actually been able to enjoy spending more time with them and we're able to, you know, do things that we could never do before because we were schlepping all around all these activities. And um, so I think especially as like the world is like, you know, we're looking at what is life going to look like with a vaccine. I do think that people are really hoping to be more flexible and, and hopefully things like working from home, at least some portion of the time will be more acceptable. And finally, the lightning round, five questions, quick answers, 30 seconds or less for all of your answers in total. Now, (laughs) what type of music or literature do you turn to when you're feeling down? So I love fantasy and I think I'm going to have to say Harry Potter is kind of my (laughs) go-to for escape. (laughs) I love that so much. What house are you? (laughs) I'm definitely Gryffindor, I think. (laughs) Respect. (laughs) (laughs) What gives you most stress relief? A person, dog, cat, or other animal? So I have two cats, a little tuxedo and a black cat, and they are just um, so mischievous and bring me so much joy. <laughs> I love that. In the midst of the chaos and suffering, where do you find small moments of joy? I think for me, just having my morning cup of coffee and just sitting on my favorite chair. Um, yeah, it's just that's that's my favorite time of day. Yeah. <laughs> what has the pandemic taught you about yourself? 
Um, I have learned that in times of crisis, uh, my coping skill is to create. So whether that is to write or, you know, start a new company or <laughs> whatever it is, that is, that's my coping skill. <laughs> wonderful. I, I resonate with that so much. Um, and, and for our last one, what gives you hope? I think um, the women, the women in our country, and we're seeing people speak up and shout from the rooftops, really, like, I'm just so heartened by the next generation, people like you, Laurie, like it's, there's just a lot to inspire. <laughs> Dr. Pooja Lakshman, thank mm-hmm. you so much for speaking with me today. Um, all your wor- words are, are valued and heard and appreciated much more than you can imagine. So um, I'm grateful. It was absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Now for the lowdown on a mental health app that utilizes the psychological strengths of gameplay to help build resilience. For that, we turn to our team at One Mind Cyber Guide. Hi there, I'm Martha Neary and I'm the project manager of One Mind Cyber Guide. You probably already use your phone for many things throughout the day, but did you know that there are lots of apps out there to help you manage your mental health and well-being? There are thousands of mental health apps available for download today. With so many to choose from, it can be hard to separate the good from the bad. That's where One Mind Cyber Guide can help. At One Mind Cyber Guide, we review apps on three different metrics, credibility, user experience, and transparency. We've reviewed over 200 products, and all of these reviews are available for free on our app guide at onemindcyberguide.org. Hi, I'm Steven Schuler, and I'm the executive director of One Mind Cyber Guide. I'm a clinical psychologist and mental health service researcher. And my research focuses on the use of technology to increase access to mental health care. The work we do at One Mind Cyber Guide is important because there's a need for objective third-party reviews of mental health apps and rigorous evaluation of their evidence base. In the coming year, we'll be featuring apps here on Brainwaves, which may be helpful for viewers. Super Better invites users to track and achieve their goals and build resilience through completing challenges and quests. When users open the app, they can select from a range of power packs, all focusing on a different component of mental resilience or epic wins. Each power pack contains customized quests, power ups, and bad guys. Quests are daily or weekly goals. When you complete activities, you'll earn resilience points. Power-ups are quick, feel-good activities to complete. Bad guys are obstacles to overcome, with tips on how to battle them. After battling bad guys, the app will also ask you a series of questions about how it went. Users can connect with friends in the Allies section, who can then share rewards and suggest activities. Science cards explain the evidence base behind every component of Superbetter. We've reviewed Superbetter at One Mind Cyber Guide and it scores highly on our credibility scale, scoring 4.67 out of 5, and on our user experience scales, scoring 4.39 out of 5. It also has exceptional transparency around data security and privacy. You can learn more about Superbetter on our app guide at cyber.guide forward slash superbetter. We look forward to seeing you next week for another app review. Thank you, CyberGuide team. Thank you to Dr. Pooja Lakshman and Dr. Tasha Golden. Viewers, thank you too. Don't forget you can post questions and also check out all of our Brainwaves episodes at onemind.org slash brainwaves. Bye everyone. Have a great day and stay safe. You're feeling anxious, afraid, alone. I haven't been able to see my family or my friends. Families that struggled to find mental health care before find it even harder now. I feel a lot of guilt in not being with my family. Are there solutions? Visit onemind.org, seeking the answers, bringing help to the front lines, accelerating brain health for all. Help us fund new treatments at onemind.org.